In the last two weeks since I've invited Thomas Alexander to come and unpack the Inara School, the material that they are introducing, have been introducing for many years, but we've just not heard about it, mainly because we're, we're all English speakers and they're German speakers, and the Germans kind of keep it to themselves. The French have been keeping it to themselves. Odon Lafontaine has really opened that up for us. Thomas has come on board, and for the last two weeks, uh, I've done five different videos with him, and I just counted up just now looking at the five videos that almost 150,000 people have watched those five videos in the last two weeks. And what's fascinating is looking down at all your comments. Many of you are commenting about this new school. Uh, it's not really new. They've been around since Goldziger in the 1920s. So over a hundred years, they have been working on this material. But it's new to you. It's new to me. It's new to many of us in the English speaking world. And that's why it's explosive. It's exciting. And many of you are asking, well, what's going to happen? What's this going to mean? How are you going to put it together? And I'm not ready yet to put it all together because there's just so many different areas that we're looking at simultaneously. And there's still an awful lot that Thomas is going to be giving us in future videos. So I want him to be able to do that before we really come and put it all together. I also want to bring Odon and Mel and Paul and uh, Murad, if possible, to bring them all on board to hear what their comebacks are. I want to see uh, if they have any responses to what the German school is saying, because so far we really haven't paid attention to them. And so far we really haven't really spotted, had a chance to do so. But let me just say this right now, just off the top of my head, just because so many are asking, Jay, what do you make of all this? What, where is this going to go? What is this going to mean? <clears throat> if it is true, and if these two guys, and these are the two guys that we've been centering on, Christoph Luxemburg and Gunther Lulling. These are the two books that we've been really unpacking in the last few videos, especially the one on Luxembourg, uh, which I put up a little over a week ago, and that has gone to over 80,000 people have watched that. The seven different layers, the seven different ways that Luxembourg used to use textual criticism, which is how you should do textual criticism. And that's fascinating that, that the scholars have not really caught up with him yet. They don't understand the ramifications. But what are the ramifications? What does this mean for scholarship in the future? If that's true, and these two guys are correct, and I believe they are, it looks so good, it looks too too powerful, too strong an argument to right now negate it. What's that going to mean for you and me? What's that going to mean for all of us? What's that going to mean for the whole area of research concerning the Quran? Because if we can prove, as Luxembourg and Luning are saying, if we can prove that the Quran, really the core of the Quran, we're not talking about all of the Quran, we're talking about the core, where it came from, the core surahs, that that was nothing more than Christian lectionaries written in Syro Aramaic in the 4th, 5th, and 6th century, oh, even earlier than that, some of the stories there go back to the 2nd century. If we can prove that this was all written in Aramaic, Syro Aramaic or Nabataean Aramaic, whichever Aramaic you want to use, Nonetheless, this is the theological language of that period. This is the theological language of that area. This is what all the Christians use whenever they're putting together their lectionaries. They were, they're writing their hymns in this. Uh, the catechisms uh, at, are all written in this, as Odon Lafontaine has reminded us. If that is the case, what will this mean for you and me? Well, I know what it'll mean for the Islamic world. They're going to Look, uh, have to look anew at their Quran. They're going to have to realize that they can no longer make the claim that it is eternal. That's the first thing. Uh, they're going to no longer be, be able to make the claim that this was sent to a man named Muhammad. That's the second claim. Uh, regardless of which Muhammad you're talking about, to me, it's almost superfluous anymore about talking about Muhammad because nobody, nobody can come up with a Muhammad living in the Hijaz, a Muhammad living in Mecca and Medina, a Muhammad who lived in a city that didn't even exist. So that Muhammad, the Muhammad of the Abbasids, whether or not you want to put it on Umar or anybody else in the 7th century, I don't even think that's important. It's not important anymore because now we have pretty much thrown that out. There is no one re who received this book called Muhammad. I don't think anybody can really support that in the 7th century. Oh, you can support it from the Abbasid material from the 9th and 10th century, but not the 7th century. And if this is the case, can you see what this is going to mean? 
I remember so many times whenever I have gone down to Speaker's Corner, when I've got up on the ladder, one of the first attacks that I always get is, Mr. Smith, you don't know Arabic. This is what has always been, has been their first port of call. This has always been their first attack, their first polemic. You don't know Arabic, and just because you had two years of Arabic and because you can read and write it doesn't mean you know it. And that is true. And I've always admitted that I'm not a fluent in Arabic. I can read and write it. I can understand it. I can look and uh, help try to conjugate it there in the chronic, the chronic Arabic, and that's all I needed to do. But that call, that claim no longer can be thrown at me anymore because it looks like Arabic had nothing to do with the Quran. It has nothing to do with the Quran. Ooh, doo, doo, doo. Just that notion right there. The Quran was never in Arabic to begin with. It's because it was interposed into Arabic and then pulled into Arabic, kicking and screaming in the 7th century and into the 8th and 9th century that we have all these problems, that we have this, the Kira'ats. This is why so much of the Quran just makes no sense. Why a good 25%, a good a quarter percent of the Quran just makes no sense. Because it was taken out of Aramaic and introduced into Arabic. And not only was it just introduced, it wasn't done so wholesale. Bits and pieces were thrown out, others were added in. They kind of mixed it around, and what you finally got was a Quran that was being put together, changed and repleted and deleted and accreted all the way through the centuries till finally we don't even know when the final Quran, when the final Ruzzle was was categorized or is canonized. We don't know that yet. We don't even have that because our manuscripts don't help us with that because the manuscripts aren't complete. Nonetheless, what is fascinating is all of these, including those manuscripts, including the Petropolinus and the, the Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, all of these old uh, rhythms, these old continental text manuscripts, they are nothing more than that exercise of taking it out of the Aramaic and putting it into the Arabic, from Aramaic to Arabic, from Aramaic to Arabic, from Aramaic to Arabic. And that's where all the problems get. Because that Aramaic, what the text that was there, that text was there, that was beautiful. That well, Those are lectionaries to our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are hymns sung in worship to our Lord Jesus Christ. They're gorgeous poetry to Jesus Christ. Those lectionaries, if you go back in the 4th, 5th, and 6th century, and we're going to do that, it's going to happen. We're going to be able to get it back to those that original text. Getting back to the Ur-Quran, the archetype. Remember the archetype that all the scholars have been talking about? They're all talking about Uthman as the archetype. They're all talking about Ubay ibn Kaab, and they're all talking about Ibn Masud. That's all moot now, because there are no manuscripts by Ubay ibn Kaab. There are no manuscripts from Ibn Masud or Ibn Musa. We don't, we haven't been able to find it for one very good reason. <laughs> this is all from the 9th and 10th century, redacting it back and attributing it to these guys from the 7th century when all, what we now know, that was all Aramaic to begin with. We should, we're looking in the, we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been looking in the wrong language. We've been looking for Arabic manuscripts. We should have been looking for Aramaic manuscripts. We've been looking for Arabic Qurans. We should have been looking for Aramaic Qurayanas, Qurayanas which is the equivalent to the same name, the readings, the recitations. Now, we've been looking in the wrong area because we've been looking in the wrong language. And we've been looking in the wrong people. And we've been looking in the wrong place. Should have been going up north in the very beginning. Should have gone back to those Christian texts, those lectionaries. Well, we're going to do that now. That's what's going to happen. And that's where all the research is. Now, what you know what this is going to do? That means we're going to have to read to all of our Bible schools or our seminaries. We're going to have to read to all our universities. We're going to have to start, instead of having just Arabic lessons on the uh, Quranic Arabic, trying to get us back to the 7th century Arabic, which didn't really exist, we're going to have to start teaching everybody Aramaic. In fact, the Muslims now are going to have to start learning Aramaic. To understand their Quran, they're going to have to go back to the Ur-Quran. They're going to have to go back to that archetype, which is all written in Aramaic. And they're going to have to start now learning the language, reading the text, and guess what they're going to find? <laughs> Do you know what they're going to find? Jesus. They're going to find Jesus all through that text. Because who do you think wrote them? Why do you think they wrote them? Where did they write them? They wrote them for people to worship Jesus. They wrote them for people to hear about him. This is liturgy in the churches. These lectionaries were there as liturgy that were re repeated, taking bits of scripture and putting them into liturgy so they could repeat them. And that's why it's called recitation. These are recitations about Jesus Christ, about the gospel. 
So the more you unpack the original Quran, the more you go back to the Urtext, the more you go back to the archetype, you're going to find Jesus. You're going to find Jesus. See if I'm wrong. I could be completely wrong. But this is November 2021, and this is the claim I'm going to make. November 30th, the last day of November, we're coming up to the Christmas season, the time when we are all going to be celebrating him coming to earth. What a better Christmas present that we can have here in 2021 than that the whole Muslim world, 1.8 billion, could finally come home to Jesus Christ. And in time, they will be able to do it with their own Quran. With their own Quran. God bless you. Can you see why I'm smiling? This has made my job a whole awful lot easier. And I hope it makes yours as well. This is Jay. Over and out.